because of the nature of Paul and myself, you know, for a long time, everybody thought we hated each other's guts, right? What up, everyone? Shaquille Mahjouri here for CBS Sports, and you know who this is. He is the host of 83 Weeks and the mind behind the rise of WCW. He's an expert in both controversy and cash. Eric Bischoff, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you. That's a, That was a good intro. I like that. Appreciate it. I got my Sean Evans on a little bit, just ripping off his shtick, you know. Um, so... We're in the aftermath of Thanksgiving. Happy belated Thanksgiving to you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, and I was reading and listening to you talk about how at the end of that WCW run, you had you know begun shaving your hair because it was a pain in the butt having to dye it black every few days. And much to your chagrin, when you came to WWE, Stephanie McMahon insisted on the black hair that you have to dye every few days. So I want to ask you, in the aftermath of Thanksgiving, how thankful are you for the hair versus hair match in pro wrestling? Very every time, you know, I, it's funny. I go to autograph signings and conventions and things like that. And of course people want to have things autographed and they're always asking me to sign like the early 1996 NWO yeah. kind of images. And I look back at those images. Now I know it's me, right? In a way <laughs> I know it's me, but I look at that and, go, well, that's, and I spend all day looking at myself, you know, with black hair. And I'm so grateful at the end of the day, because I go back to my hotel room and just, Look at myself in the mirror and thank God that I didn't have to dye my hair anymore. <laughs> yes, keeping it au natural. Uh, when we think about Eric Bischoff and WCW, there were uh, so many great creative decisions that really drove up uh, pro wrestling in that period of the mid to late 90s, the NWO, Goldberg Street, going live every week. But I'm wondering, Eric, whether it be in WCW or your various points with WWE, is there a creative idea you've had that you're really proud of that maybe doesn't get as much shine? Oh, you know, yes, yes. And look, the NWO, it was a phenomenon still is to this day. I mean, and WWE is NWO merchandise is still one of the top selling items in a WWE merchandise catalog. If you can believe that. So it's it's something very unique in that regard, but and this this storyline doesn't get a lot of print, you know, because it happened in TNA. But I really, really am proud of the structure and the detail that went into the Aces and Eights mm -hmm. storyline. I thought that was a really, really well executed storyline. It was a storyline where I was able to kind of apply everything that I learned, both good and bad while developing other stories, including the NWO. And I was able to kind of take that experience and polish it, recognize the flaws in it, right? And polish it and improve it. And that was really the aces and eights storyline in TNA. And it's, uh, it certainly didn't get the acclaim of, of NWO for a lot of reasons, but in terms of story structure and detail, um, I thought that was really well done. Yeah, I think of aces and eights often like, you know, if we're moving outside the Oscars and more into the independent film scene, one of those critically acclaimed moments. Because every time I search for anything pertaining to Eric creatively or aces and eights, it's nothing but compliments. I feel like that storyline has aged well over time. It, it has. And, you know, truth be known, you know, there was a little bit of the NWO formula in there. There was a lot of the NWO formula, the elements of the story. Right. The anticipation, the surprise, you know, the action, the reality of it. Um, so there were a lot of the main elements of the NWO story mm -hmm. within Aces and Eights. But the characters were completely different. And truth be known. I was how do you say this in a way that makes it sound acceptable? It was a derivative of something that was very popular in television at the time. Sons of Anarchy. Yes. So it was like, how do we take this phenomenon that's currently hot, you know, on television, turn it into a wrestling storyline, but using a lot of the elements and, and things that I learned, again, by success and things that I learned by mistakes mm -hmm. and clean that up and create a new storyline. And like I said, that was Aces and Eights, but it was, a, it was a fun experience. Still have not seen a single episode of Sons of Anarchy, but I'll have to get on it. Um, Eric, you are in the headlines all the time because uh, you are... 
you know, you, you did so much in this industry. And so there's weight to the things you say and the analysis that you give. And you talked recently about sort of the, the chaos going on in the WWE, um, whether it pertains to the, you know, the responsibility to shareholders to make these budget cuts or NXT, whatever the case may be. I was wondering if you could and you've and you've been in the circus not too long ago, if you could make one fundamental change to WWE on the business or administrative and to kind of reel in that chaos, what would you do? You know, on the administrative end, I really don't have any real input. I think if, if, if one is objective and your opinion isn't swayed by your emotions and your fandom, which is kind of hard to find on the internet, right? Uh, or, or, or in you know, wrestling news sites or dirt sheets. Um, but if you really look at the business of the WWE's business model, I'm not going to suggest they're flawless, but it's a little bit hard to imagine improving upon it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you just step back again and take your emotion out of it, your biases out of it, whether you're a WWE fan and you don't really like AEW or vice versa. Take all that kind of childish stuff out of it and just look at where the WWE is, particularly coming. And you know, it's a live touring company. Mm -hmm. They are a live touring company and they had to abandon touring and shift their model um, and manage their model accordingly. And they did and they have. And if you look at their the business of the WWE business model, it's really, really done well over the last two or three years. And then if you go back even further pre pre COVID, you know, just looking at the stock price and the revenues and the expansion into global markets around the world, it's hard to kind of look for a flaw. I think it's a really well run, run business. I think the flaw is more in the creative process. Mm -hmm. That's where the flaw is. That's where the opportunity lies, frankly, for WWE to really increase their business around the world is by finally addressing the creative challenges that exist in WWE. Okay. What, what's one creative change you would make? If you could go in tomorrow and say this uh, principle or this idea of how we tackle creative needs to change, what would it be? Um, it would be story structure. Mm -hmm. It would be taking a more pragmatic approach to, to story structure or more di actually discipline would be a better word than pragmatic. It would be first recognizing that a good story has to have structure. You know, it, it would be no different than going and shooting a movie and not really having a script that's blocked out and not really knowing where the end of the movie is and kind of starting the movie and not really sure how you want to finish the movie. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't be in the movie business that way. You couldn't produce television shows that way. You can't even write a book that way. So I, I think with WWE, because of the sheer volume of product that they produce globally mm -hmm. every week, that, it, it only creates a, a more significant need for a more disciplined and well thought out creative story structure. And I think once that was in place, and that was really one of my goals going into WWE in my last run there in 2019, I was really hoping to bring that formula to WWE, but I never really got, never got around to it. It wasn't there long enough. I remember, but, I sensed a lot of excitement around that time when you and Paul Heyman were brought in to handle the respective- Yeah, a ton of potential, yeah. ton of potential. I was really looking forward to working with Paul, you know, because people, you know, because of the nature of Paul and myself, you know, for a long time, everybody thought we hated each other's guts, right? Even when I was working in WWE as a talent in the early 2000s, everybody thought, oh, man, there's heat between Heyman and Bischoff. Nothing was further from the truth. We really enjoyed kind of collaborating in the arena, you know, by ourselves <laughs> when nobody was around to hear it. And I was really looking forward to that. But just the nature of the process, mm -hmm. you know, when I got to WWE, it was, it was crazy. It was Paul and I very rarely had time to sit down and really – you know, riff and, and collaborate and create. We were, we were both on separate treadmills. You know, we were in the same gym, but we were both on separate tre treadmills and really didn't get a chance to really collaborate, which is unfortunate. You know, on a personal level, I think I would have really enjoyed working with Paul. I think Paul feels the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Paul feels that I would enjoy working with him. <laughs> I'm not sure he would feel the same way about me, but Seriously, it would have been something really interesting to explore both on a personal level and look 
obviously at a business level, it would have been a breath of fresh air. And that's the other part of the creative kind of mm. flaw, I guess, in, in WWE, at least in my opinion, is that there is such a sameness to everything. Mm-hmm. Not Okay, one show's red and one show's blue. I know there's different names, you know, on the roster. But the look, the feel, the storytelling technique or lack thereof, everything feels so familiar Mm -hmm. and has felt so familiar for so long. I think it would need to be desanitized. The WWE, in my opinion, is such a perfectly executed live production that it doesn't even feel live anymore. It feels like you're watching a feature film. It's usually so well produced. And I think with wrestling, because of what it is, it's an arena based event that you want the viewers at home to actually feel like they're part of that event, make them feel like they're part of that party. And sometimes overproducing a show can take that away from the, from the, the, the home viewer. Well, right? in, in a sense, make that's what kind of happened, right? With the ECW rebrand. And it's starting to feel like that's kind of happening with NXT. Do you think that NXT needed a fresh coat of paint to begin with in terms of this whole rebranding? Again, I'll probably say essentially the same type of thing, but the the missed opportunity, in my opinion, with NXT would be let that be your gritty kind of Mm. darker, more spontaneous, just not so clean and pretty. It's it's just it it disconnects the viewer and it's great television and networks love production values, right? They get ex- network executives love production values, but sometimes I think the quest for such perfect production value actually disconnects you, mm-hmm. disconnects you in a way, as I described to the home viewing audience, it just feels too clean. Yeah. And I know that's something you sort of complimented AEW on in the past is that more of a pro wrestling experience that they give you that makes you feel as a viewer at home that you're actually there. And that leads, it's funny, I feel like we've been leading up to this question based on your takes on the emotional internet audience and, and uh, the hatred for Paul Heyman. Uh, AEW and Tony Khan, when I, when I look at your two names when they kind of cross paths in the news cycle, the way I, as someone in the industry, takes it at is, well, Eric Bischoff was asked a question, or it's Eric Bischoff's job to talk about pro wrestling and so once in a while he may say something critical and if tony khan wants to defend himself or make comparisons to wcw so be it right we're in the business of talking where is your relationship at professionally with tony and AEW at this point because i think it was what in may that you made your last appearance there yeah it was in may that i made my last appearance and i think tony and i up until that point had a, a very cordial friendly relationship not to suggest that we were friends and i distinguish friends you know people that i talk to two or three times a week once or twice a week or have over to my house for dinner or things like that you know certainly didn't have that relationship but we were friendly and cordial um mutual respect there um all that good stuff uh, it wasn't until you know recently and you're right you know i was asked a question and i responded and you know it it caused, I'm guessing, hard feelings from Tony. I, I, I tried to call Tony and he didn't call me back. You know, once I, once I, you know, someone told me who Tony was complaining to about how upset he was at the things that I said, and this third person will show remain nameless at this point said, Hey, why don't you just give Tony a call? I said, sure. I'm not mad at Tony. I don't carry grudges. Uh, it doesn't change the way I feel about Tony. I just had to express my opinion and react to something that actually Tony said Mm -hmm. that involved me that I took as being disrespectful of my accomplishments and even more disrespectful, disrespectful, and quite frankly, ignorant with relation to the comment he made about Ted Turner. That's what I reacted to, but I wasn't angry with, with Tony. So I, you know, when my friend said, yeah, you should just give him a call. So I thought, all right, I'll give him a call. I called, I left a message and haven't heard a word back. So evidently he's a little pissed off, but that's okay. It's sort of the nature of the beast sometimes, but I hope, uh, you know, everything will be mended over time. I'm sure it will. It seems like pro wrestling grudges, for the most part, don't don't stick forever. Um, are you okay to go a few extra minutes, Eric? I don't want to I'll do whatever you want to do here. I got nothing to do the rest of the day, brother. That's amazing. Uh, okay, let's hit on a couple things before we get out. Um, you know, 
obviously WCW eventually merges with the WWF, now WWE, but there was a there was a moment in time where it looked like WCW may press on with the announcement that Fusion Media uh, had planned on acquiring WCW and that you were going to be brought back in the fold. I was wondering if you could share some of the ideas you had for that revamped WCW in 2001. I know one fan was wondering specifically if, if Hulk Hogan would have been involved. Hulk Hogan would have been involved. Bill Goldberg would have likely have been involved. Sting, a lot of the top names uh, that you were already familiar with at WCW, not all of them, by the way, but most of them um, would have definitely been involved. There's another group within that list that would have most likely been involved. Um, but to be honest, we, we didn't really have much of a chance to formulate a creative strategy during the period of time when we were trying to acquire WCW, most of our energy, well, first of all, was focused on raising $67 million, which was the price tag at the time. Um, but between the money raise and looking at ways that we could reduce costs and increase to the best of our ability, the quality of the product, was by far where we spent most of the time. As an example, you know, I, we wanted to save money on live touring, right? Or, or excuse me, live television mm -hmm. on tour, rather than showing up in a different city every Monday night, a different city every Thursday night, and all of the costs associated with that, not just with talent, but with the crew and trucks and everything else, very, very expensive. So one of the strategies that we identified early on was to, move to create a location in Las Vegas. That was our home base location. We we're actually um, at the time we were negotiating with Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas to do that, to build a facility exclusively for us that they could also use when we're not using it. But that would have been our home base in Vegas. It would have saved money on trance. It would have saved money on hotels. It would have been just on a cost per episode basis, significantly less expensive. So there was a lot of things like that. That's one example. But there were a lot of things like that. How can we reduce our expenses, maintain or increase in some cases the quality of the product? Um, that was the majority of our, our, our efforts. There was, there's, I, I didn't even know if I, if I could squeeze it in, but I really want to. There was sort of an absurd but on-brand collaboration in the early mid 2000s with WWE and Girls Gone Wild, which I know you had a hand in facilitating. <laughs> um, I, I know about how it came together, but I was wondering if you had any amusing memories of the actual day of event. All right, I'm gonna tell you, because I know you're in a hurry, brother. I got all afternoon, but you're a busy man. So here's one quick story. Yeah. I'll try to tell it as fast as I can. No, I, listen, I am fine for time if you are. <laughs> all right, all right. So the nature of the event, and for those of you don't know what girls gone wild is it was sorry cbs sports bring it up it was um adult entertainment college kids adult entertainment big parties crazy stuff on the beach spring break type stuff but over the top right and the guy that ran that company was a guy by the name of joe francis he was a really brilliant guy i mean he he really was brilliant he was just equally as nuts but um Joe was making money hand over fist. I mean, he was making a fortune with Girls Gone Wild. And Joe was actually in the process of trying to negotiate to purchase Playboy back at the time, right? That's how much money Joe had. And he was serious about it. Um, and Vince McMahon, you know, I, I don't know how I brought it to him, but I said, hey, you know, this thing called Girls Gone Wild, what if we produce a pay-per-view? down at spring break and you guys produce it. It's a live event. We don't have to stage it. We're not bringing anybody in. We're not doing any creative. We're just covering the event as an event. So long story short, we got kicked out of Florida. We went down to shoot in Florida, the city of wherever the, Joe was shooting and decided he didn't want girls gone wild down there. Mm -hmm. So he was able to shut down girls gone wild. We had to scramble for a location and we ended up, in, I think Corpus Christi, Texas, or wherever it was. And when in doubt, Eric, go to Texas. <laughs> we, we, yeah. So we get to Texas and it's hectic, right? Now I know I've got Kevin Dunn coming up. 
The WWE production truck is there. I mean, it's it's a big, big, expensive production. And it's the first kind of outside of WWE thing that I was ever doing with that. So I obviously I really wanted it to work, right? So we get to we get to Texas, got to our hotels, got everybody set up, got our staging, got our lights set up two days before at the at the venue. And then the night before the show was supposed to start, I was at my hotel the evening and I got a phone call. It was a local sheriff. Mm-hmm. Said, I want you and everybody associated with your crew and cast to meet at the venue, you know, in like two hours. So I got everybody together. We were all, you know, going to go to bed early that night because we had a big day. So I got everybody together. We go to this big meeting and there's about 37 cops there, right? 40, whatever it was, a lot of cops everywhere. And my crew, including some of the WWE crew, we all get there and these cops are giving us, okay, here's the do's and here's the don'ts. And here's what's going to happen if you break any of these violations or if you, if you violate any of these rules. And there's going to be no questions. We're not going to have a discussion. We're going to confiscate that truck. And he pointed to the production truck. I don't know how much it was worth. I'm guessing a couple, seven million, maybe. I don't know. Five million. They're expensive. Yeah. Big, big truck, all of the satellite equipment, all of the cameras, everything. He said, I will confiscate everything in in this venue that isn't a personal cell phone. It's like, oh my gosh. And it went through the list. And of course, one of them was, you know, no drugs, right? Absolutely no drugs. Mm-hmm. And there was a long list of other things. I mean, you can imagine what most of those were. Yeah. So, okay, okay, okay. We got this under control. We got it under control. Okay, cut to next day. We're all set up. Snoop Dogg was supposed to shut up, set up and open up the show with us, right? He was supposed to be there two hours early for a, a walkthrough or rehearsal. Now Kevin Dunn is there. Kevin Dunn's ahead of production for WWE. Kevin Dunn's there. Hour goes by, no Snoop. Two hours go by, no Snoop. Finally, I don't know what it was, two and a half, three hours later, whenever it was, Snoop comes walking in with an entourage of about 15 or 20 people, and they are blazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never seen joints that big. I don't know how you roll them. The pie, I don't know, man. It was, they were huge. I just, it was shocking to me. There was just like this big billowing cloud of smoke <laughs> following behind him. And I'm looking at all of the cops. I'm going, oh, God, this thing's going to get shut down before it even gets started. So for whatever reason, the cops left us alone, maybe because they knew it was Snoop. They didn't want the heat, whatever. So that didn't cause the problem. I thought, dodge that bullet. So finally, I go to get Snoop. I said, Snoop, we got to walk through this, man. We got to rehearse this. Kevin Dunn's waiting, you know, and he's Kevin can be a little tough to work with when it's showtime. He's he's a tough perfectionist kind of guy. So finally, finally, I get Snoop, corralled him over to where Kevin Dunn was, and Kevin's talking him through this segment. Here's what we're going to do, and then this camera's going to do that, and that camera's going to do that. And Snoop's off looking like, like we're not even there. And finally, Kevin looks over to me and I'm looking at Kevin. It's like, fuck, I don't know. Sorry. Shoot. I don't know. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> the, the, the video goes on my channel. So I'd say okay. whatever you like. <laughs> and Kevin says, Snoop, are you, are you following me? And Snoop goes, just because I'm not looking at you doesn't mean I'm not listening to you. Oh, this is going to be just a fun night. <laughs> it turned out it turned out okay. Nobody, nothing got confiscated. Nobody went to jail. Okay. And I'm grateful to never have to have had to work with Snoop Dogg ever again. Yeah. I, I see him so much in the pro wrestling sphere. I feel like maybe he's gotten easier to work with. He's Uncle Snoop now. I feel like he's turned over a new leaf in terms of approachability. Yeah, you go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Always the optimist. Okay, you've been so generous with your time, Eric, but I'd be remiss if I didn't plug your wonderful podcast, 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. So I want to ask you this on the way out. Uh, obviously, pro wrestling is huge on nostalgia, and there's lots of big moments in the history of WCW and beyond that you've covered. But I'm wondering, what's one great memory that you sort of unearthed through your podcast that you had maybe totally forgotten about up until you talked about it? Oh, wow. There's so many of them. You know, what's really cool about doing this podcast is, you know, we're going back and we're covering pay-per-views and nitros and things like that, going all the way back to 1994 sometimes, right? 
And in most cases, I haven't looked at any of those events since the day I produced them. Never have. I don't go back and watch stuff. So there's so many things, really. Um, I guess the one thing that I'm probably as proud of as anything else is the cruiserweight division. I I think, you know, Nitro changed the wrestling world in so many different ways that we're still seeing today. And I'm, I recognize those things and I'm grateful for them in a positive, healthy way, not in a ego driven kind of way, but I'm very proud of those things because they've lasted, they've endured, they've improved the business as we know it. But I think the one thing that doesn't, even I didn't really recognize how valuable of a decision it was until long afterwards, probably because of doing you know, the podcast was the whole cruiserweight division and the way we went about that. I, I'm, I'm really proud of that. It doesn't get as much attention as some other things, but I think fundamentally it probably had more to do with changing the industry that we see today than is just about anything else. Amazing. Yeah. Big fan of the cruiserweight division myself. So thank you, Eric. Uh, I want to leave you with the last word, so I'll do my little plug now. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching this through CBS Sports, thank you to CBS Sports for empowering the video. If you're watching this on my YouTube channel, link to the full article with Eric in the description right now. Please subscribe, tap the notification bell, thumbs up, all that fantastic stuff. Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, plug away, my friend, anything you'd like to share today. I don't really have much to plug. Just want to thank you for the opportunity and thanks for listening to to 83 Weeks. You know, Conrad's got seven great podcasts now Wild. that you can get. It's incredible the amount of content that we're producing. Check out adfreeshows.com. That same content is available plus a whole lot more. Um, so much content, it's really hard to believe. So uh, check it out. But more than anything, just thank you. And I hope everybody has a great holiday season. Yes, happy, happy Thanksgiving weekend to everyone down in the U.S.